We're in your world history, uh, chapter 27, and the second part of the continuation of communism. And we got to Africa. So we're in um, section three in Africa, the struggle from, for freedom. So let's begin. The collapse of the Soviet Union reduced the amount of terrorist activity in the 1990s. But communist China replaced Russia in East Africa. There were communist strongholds in Africa in Angola, Mozambique, Zaire, and Ethiopia. In Nambia, which became independent of South Africa in 1990, the United Nations and the United States negotiated a peace agreement that provided for the withdrawal of Cuban and Angolian troops. Uh, Southwest Africa People's Organization, that's a Marxist or communist terrorist group, um, as the official government of the country. They decided to be the official government. So Nambia was the first country to have a Marxist terrorist group as their government, in at least in Africa, called SWAPO, SWAPO, right? So here's a picture of the, the SWAPO party here and down into Nambia. So here we have um, the struggle going on. Even though the Soviet Union had fallen, we have these communist strongholds that have already started in Africa. And China um, uh, helping some of these as, long, as well as Cuba, um, replacing Russia and um, basically as uh, putting in um, or communist leaders um, into um, authority there. So just remember, and Nambia being a, the first um, country to have a, a terrorist group for their official government. Somalia. And when I think of Somalia, I always think of the poorest and the worst of situations, just being um, over in Africa um, and seeing what was going on and terrorists and people, young people being killed. And just recently, um, uh, when we were over there, um, basically the prayer group that we went, the um, Muslim terrorists came in and killed all of those young um, college age kids in the midst. Um, there, so much persecution of Christians there, it's ridiculous. Well, anyway, in Somalia, in 1991, a civil war broke out in the East African country of Somalia. You can see there, picture there where Somalia is on the map. So rival Muslim and Marxist warlords battled with one another, causing widespread famine that prompted United Nations to intervene. American troops were included in these peacekeeping forces to go to Somalia. In 1994, during a mission to subdue a Somalian warlord, 16 American troops were killed because the United Nations refused to permit them to bring proper weapons and equipment. That's terrible. Uh, U.S. troops were withdrawn there from there, and later the United Nations force pulled out too. But Somalia continues to be ravaged by violence and hardship, even today. So this was... Uh, a really harsh and sickening thing that happened over there because our troops were only allowed to bring only the weapons that the United Nations told them to bring and the United Nations were in charge of our troops which is pretty ugly and so basically allowing um, our American troops to be killed in the midst of this so I would say that was due to um, the negation of our president back then to, um, to um, have them be under the United Nations instead of America. President at that time was President Clinton. So anyway, let's go on from there. That's a sickening thing. Bloody conflicts in Rwanda. It was a mess in Rwanda. As you see the picture here, pictures in the corner here kind of tells where Rwanda is here in Africa so well 
Between 1994 and 1995, at least 500,000 people died in Rwanda. 500,000 people. And there's a movie on Rwanda, you can see it was, it's, it's very, very, very sad, depicting what happened in, when there were two tribes, these are two tribes <coughs> that basically were um, ethnically trying to cleanse each other. They were they were both um, you know similar. Um, one of the one of the tribes were a little bit darker in complexion than the other tribe, but otherwise um, there was little difference. But they had been rivals, the Hutu tribe, and they attacked the Tutsi tribe. The Hutus used this opportunity to wipe out their Tutsi enemies. Five hundred thousand of them! My goodness. The Tutsis could not defend themselves. Why? Because the government had taken away their arms. So because the government, in the midst of this, um, and a, a communist Marxist type governments, took away the, the Tutsis' um, weapons, it enabled the Hutus to come in and totally wipe them out. You know, I'm going to say totally, I don't know how we would call that a ethnic cleansing. I'm sure you would, but so um, they said 500,000 down the corner. It says 800,000 minority Tutsis um, perished. Tutsis, um, Tutsis and Hutus, some of them did too, in this Rwanda genocide. Perhaps as many as three quarters of the Tutsi population were gone. Ugly, ugliness in Rwanda. Liberia. You can see on that map there where Liberia is. Here, clear over in the west here. So along the western Africa coast was Liberia. Liberia was actually set up um, early, um, you know, we're talking about in the 18, you know, early 1800s, late in, under um, the President Monroe, I think. And it was, it was actually set up for free slaves to, to go and inhabit there. So, um, but now um, they're experiencing civil war and that started in 1989. Along the West Coast, Liberia experienced this civil war. A series of ceasefire agreements gave some um, um, respite for violence, but this heavily armed gangs of youth still stalked the streets of Monrovia, the capital. On September 3rd, 1996, Ruth Perry became the leader of Liberia, and she was the first woman head of state in Africa, of any state in Africa, and you can see her up there in that picture. So Liberia, again, having um, harsh problems because of these armed gangs, these gangs of youth traveling through and um, attacking people. So problems even in Liberia. Sudan. When you think of Sudan, you think of Islamic terrorism of the worst sort. You know, um, many martyrs of Christian, many Christians being killed um, by the Sudanese, you know, uh, government, Islamic terrorism. One of the most serious conflicts were involving Muslim terrorism unfolded in Sudan, Africa's largest country. Islamic government of the North waged a war of persecution against Christian and Nubian tribes of the South. Nubian were more, um, you know, animalistic type jungle tribes. And then Christians, well, they, they persecuted the Christians and they enslaved the Nubians with slavery, actually, and selling them. So Libya and Iran encouraged the jihad or the holy war primarily against Christians, wanting to make this area completely Islamic or Muslim. So they were Muslim terrorists coming in, Islamic terrorism. Such atrocities as the burning of churches, the enslavement of young Nubians sold to wealthy Arabs throughout the Middle East, forced conversions to Islam, and even the crucifixion of many 
who would not renounce their faith continued in the 1990s. Can you believe that? All of these actions were ignored by the Western media. We didn't hear about them, did we? As of 1995, two million people had been killed in the Sudanese war. Over a million Nubians were incarcerated in concentration camps. So can you believe this is going on and we don't even know because it's not being televised, not being told us about the persecution and mainly of Christians in Sudan. I have a friend actually is coming to church in West Bentley and Far Reaching Ministries and he has su supported um, uh, um, the fight against um, Islamic terrorism there and supporting these Christians that are in Sudan. And so it's ongoing, very, very um, turmoiled place. Let's just say that. Can you believe in 1995, two million people were killed? Two million. You know, there were six million Jews in the Holocaust. Two million are being killed here on this time that we live in Sudan. And the sad thing is that we're not even hearing about it, are we? And then, of course, the other countries like Libya and Iran encouraging the killing of Christians in Sudan. Terrible. Hope for the future. Despite the unrest and turmoil in Africa, Christian missions continue to thrive. Isn't that the way it is? When Christians are persecuted, um, the more Christians get saved because they, they see the courage. And if you look to Africa, you'll see the courage in the true Christians in the midst of not only Sudan, but other parts of Africa, Nigeria, and, you know, and even now um, into um, Kenya and in Ethiopia, you know, so Zambia. The government, which emerged in the 1990s, responded to the influence of Christian missionaries with a commitment to rebuild its economy and political institutions on biblical standards. So Zambia is saying, we're going to be a Christian nation. That's hope for the future, right? Many African Christians faced severe persecution and thousands died as martyrs for their faith. But the light of the gospel continues to draw men to Jesus Christ. African, if we get to heaven, we're going to see a lot, a lot of African martyrs in heaven, you know, that have stood for Jesus in the midst of the se se severest persecution. Some examples here, some pictures here. Here's where, see where Zambia is? Right here. Declaring themselves to be a Christian nation. South Africa. Through the 1980s, the United Nations sponsored heavy trade sanctions to South Africa in protest of their racial policy of apartheid. Apartheid was segregation. So here we have South African he Africa here, and most of the United Nations saying, no, we're not going to support South Africa. In fact, even the United States at that point. These sanctions, the sanctions, they, that they would not support them, you know, in trade with them or anything, caused widespread, widespread suffering and unemployment, especially among the black South Africans and immigrants. They were the very, very much in poverty, and now they would become in more having more poverty problems and unemployment. This weakened the government's attempt to achieve gradual reform while resisting communism. So the government was weakened uh, because the communists, that's what they do. The communism comes in and causes um, racial problems to the hilt, you know, says of racism, claims racism over and, and it comes in. And as they do, um, they get everything in turmoil, races fighting. Um, and it's, it comes to a point where they say, okay, now we're going to, put in our communist leader, and he'll take care of everything. Surely what happened in South Africa. The restrictions on South Africa grew tighter when the United States preserved a rough policy of 
trade restrictions in 1980. So the United States pursued this policy, which made things worse, a lot worse in South Africa. You see here the, the South African Communist Party coming into control gradually. Nelson Mandela. So I remember hearing of him thinking, oh, he's a great man. You know, he's going to stand up like Martin Luther, um, Martin Luther King, you know. He's going to stand up like Martin Luther King. He's our hope. Although he was completely Marxist, which is communist, completely communist. So everyone looked at him in one way when he was another way. South Africa's economy plummeted due to the trade sanctions. Their economy was just in the pits and people were poorer than ever. Finally, they released Marxist agitator. They had him in jail actually, actually, and they decided they needed to release him as requested by the um, communist system going on there, the government taking over. Um, that they would release Nelson Mandela from prison in 1990. He was the head of what's called ANC, the African National Congress, communist organization. They agreed to share power with ANC as long as um, they were dominated by South African Communist Party. Well, they were. The South African is S-A-C-P, South African Communist Party. And um, ANC is the African National Congress. So you think, okay, now the African National Confer Congress is taken over by the Communist Party. So here we have, you know, so um, ANCE or ANC controlled the, the South African Parliament. So now South Africa would have a communist ruler. Mandela, a communist dictator? Yes, indeed. Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. The elections were marked with widespread fraud, especially directed against the moderate black Zulu candidates who opposed the ANC communist and feared totalitarian rule. So they were trying to come against him. Well, it didn't work. It was widespread fraud, kind of like what we've been having here, huh? But anyway, Mandela campaigned with the communist leaders and was photographed with a clenching fist, saying he's communist, the victory salute of communist terrorists. Hmm. Mandela's presidential in inauguration on May 10th, 1994, with the UN Secretary General hmm, Boutros Ghali, and the communist dictator Fidel Castro from Cuba were his honored guest. Yes, indeed. Nelson Mandela, the communist, was a communist dictator, and he did not hide as everyone thought, oh, he's going to do great. Yeah, in communism. And the first thing communists do is to get rid of Christians. We know that. And there were many Christians in South Africa, white and black, you know. So here we have some pictures of what happened. We have another picture here I thought was very interesting. And that's Nelson Mandela um, shaking the hands of Yasser Arafat, which, you know, the PLO. So basically, South African and communism, not only against Christians, but against Israel, you know, so with some Muslim ties there. And here's a picture down here of him with uh, Fidel Castro. Remember him from Cuba? The, the communist violent dictator of Cuba? Hmm. I still talk to a lot of people that say, oh, Mandela, you know, he was great. He's as good as Martin Luther King. Hmm. No way. The Communist Government in South Africa. So Mandela appointed the Communist Party members as Democratic Socialists, he called them, to cabinet positions. So Democratic Socialists, kind of a hidden term of communism. Sorry there, I bumped it. 
He moved to abolish prayer. Can you believe that? Well, that's a sign. What did they first do? Get rid of Christians and abolish prayer. No more prayer at the legislative last sessions. Hmm. And by 1991, a system of radical affirmative action was put into effect in South Africa. Their affirmative action would be very, um, very strict. You know, thousands of administrators and mining engineers, especially Boers, Boers were mainly white, they were Dutch. They were all replaced with poorly trained ANC communist supporters, causing economic and political chaos. So what they did is they were getting rid of all of the white people that were there that were, that had come. Remember, um, the Dutch and the English had settled in in South Africa and were involved in the government. Well, first thing Mandela was to get rid of did was to get rid of them. And now South Africans' future remained uncertain, and and certainly in turmoil. Cuba. So Cuba, what was going on in Cuba? Well, Fidel Castro, remember, he's reigning um, his communist terrorism in Cuba for many years. Cuba continued to have problems, of course, international and domestically. The Cuban economy began to decline, especially when sub subsidies from the Soviet Union stopped. Remember Cuba, it was supported by the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union fell economically and could not support Cuba. So now they weren't getting their subsidies, their food and all their things, you know, from the Soviet to help them. However, other communist nations like Venezuela, Venezuela is down in um, uh, South America, um, and they had a socialist leader named Hugo Chavez, and he began to subsidize the Cuban regime, bringing food and supplies in. Became his friend, two communist friends, huh? two communist dictators. Cuba remained belligerent to the United States, receiving assistance from China and Iran. So China and Iran um, were helping um, Fidel Castro with Cuba now. Fidel Castro um, ruled since 1959. And then he began to be in poor health. But in 2006, his brother, Raul Castro, took over as president. So... As was going on in Cuba. I think that's my last slide. Um, and we went through now all of um, the communism still going on. And even today, you know, in Africa and South America and Central America and China, um, there's still the repression of freedom, especially Christian freedom throughout the world. But we know in the midst of all this, you know, Christians still stand um, for the love and, um, and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. I believe Jesus is coming soon.